A few months ago, my wife and three kids went away for the weekend without me. I thought I'd give myself a little treat that weekend. I would sleep in on a Saturday morning. Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. I was in the deepest of deepest sleep when the phone rang at 6.30 in the morning. I jumped out of bed, I answered the phone, and it wasn't my wife, it was a woman who was crying. And she said, Haney, I just killed a patient with asthma. That was the voice of one of my former residents, Sarah, who's one of the kindest, funniest, and smartest residents that I've ever had the pleasure of training. So I knew there had to be more to the story. And the story that I'm going to share with you today is her story, and she's given me permission to share it with you. When Sarah was done with residency, she went up to Maine to work at a major academic center. But a few nights a month, she works at a small community hospital. Small. She's the only doc in the ER. There's only one nurse, and there's only one respiratory therapist that covers the entire hospital. Well, on this fateful night, EMS called ahead and said, we're bringing in an asthmatic, and he looks terrible for 15 minutes away. The patient winds up in the ED, and she finds out that this is a 35-year-old male, multiple intubations, and he, in fact, looks terrible. She springs into action. She starts continuous nebulization. She gives steroids. She gives magnesium. She stands by the patient's bedside to resuscitate him. 15 minutes go by, and the patient is still looking terrible, and Sarah doesn't know what to do. He's too unstable to transfer, so she digs into her pocket, and she thinks about what things she can do. So she comes up with Heliox and sends the respiratory therapist on his way somewhere in the hospital to get the tanks for Heliox. Well, the respiratory therapist is away. 20 minutes go by, and the patient looks at Sarah and says, Doc, I can't breathe. I feel like I'm going to die. Please just intubate me. And Sarah, knowing that she shouldn't intubate this patient, she blinked, and she decided to go ahead and intubate him because she didn't know what else to do. So RSI medicines were pushed, and she went to take a look, and he wasn't as easy of an airway as she thought she would be. Four looks and bagging in between, finally the tube went in, and only after minutes of the patient being intubated, he became bradycardic, hypotensive, and he coded. Sarah jumped on the chest herself, and she started doing CPR, ACLS begun. 30 minutes went by, no pulse. An hour, no return spontaneous circulation. An hour and a half, and still no vital signs. And an hour and 45 minutes, she called the code. 35-year-old male dead of asthma. Today, what we're going to discuss is the patient with life-threatening asthma. I'll go over some pearls that you can use in your management of this patient. Because this patient is very different than the standard asthmatic. Some people consider it to be a completely different disease. Yes, there's bronchoconstriction and difficulty with respirations, but the critical difference is that these patients have hemodynamic compromise that can kill them instantly. And I want to show you just how it can do this. So all of us together, and you don't have to stand up, I'd like you all to just take a nice deep breath and breathe out. And breathe in and breathe out. And what you'll see with this flow diagram is what we're going to remember when we manage the patient with the ventilator. This is the flow diagram. Everything here above the baseline is inspiration, or a positive pressure breath. Everything below the baseline is expiration. And what you'll notice is between each of your breaths that you just took, there was a brief pause as everything came back to baseline, a zero flow. This is normal breathing. OK, here's what we're going to do next. Do just as I say. Take a breath in and breathe out. Now take a breath in and breathe out. Take a breath in, breathe out, breath in. It gets harder and harder to do this because what's happening here is before the end of expiration, you're taking another breath in, and what you're getting is breath stacking. And this is what kills the asthmatic patient because this creates positive pressure in the chest. It creates an obstructive shock, a compartment syndrome of the chest, if you will. And we'll get back to this in a little bit. But let's talk about some of the medications that often get forgotten in these patients. And the first one I like to talk about is epinephrine. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. And before we had albuterol as our beta-2 agonist of choice, there was epinephrine. But think about this. The person who's not ventilating well, the person who has a silent chest, they're not getting albuterol down to the target organs, to the smooth muscles. So you need something to cause bronchodilation. 
So using intramuscular or intravenous epi is the way to go to get bronchodilation and get that person breathing. People will be scared away by epinephrine for the person who comes in tachycardic and hypertensive, but the truth is, is they're that way because they're struggling to stay alive. And once you bronchodilate them, there are studies that show that their tachycardia and hypertension get better by giving epinephrine once they can breathe again. Now, I love Heliox, said no respiratory therapist ever. <laughs> and the reason why is because the Heliox tanks are never sitting conveniently by the patient with asthma. They're somewhere deep in the bowels of the hospital, and you have to send them away to find them. Now, Heliox is a mixed bag of literature. There's some good, some bad. For the patient who has a distal airway obstruction, in theory, what happens is there's turbulent flow, it makes it harder to breathe, and it's hard to deliver distal medications to the alveoli. And so by giving Heliox a less dense gas, you make airflow more laminar, makes it easier to breathe, and medication delivery better. But again, the problem with Heliox for me is that I have to send a critical member of my resuscitation team somewhere else in the hospital, and I need that person by the bedside. So for me, if it's not by the bedside, only marginal benefit for Heliox, I skip it. But what I do do very early on is I get my patients to chill. And what I mean by this is the patient who comes in with asthma, life-threatening asthma, they're anxious. And this creates a critical downward spiral for them. The person who comes in, they're anxious. That means they're tachypnic. And when they're tachypnic, they spend less time in expiration, which is what the asthmatic needs. And what happens is they have more breath stacking, which makes it harder to breathe, which makes them more anxious which makes them more tachypnic, which leads to more breath stacking, and on and on and on. So early on, you want to get your patients anxiolytics. And I like to use subdissociative doses of ketamine because in addition to the anxiolysis, I also get bronchodilation with it. But if you like to use dexmethamine or low-dose fentanyl, that's fine. Just get the person relaxed so that they have more efficient breathing. And then I like to go for non-invasive ventilation early. And this is also something that is somewhat controversial or heavily discussed, if you will, in the resuscitation community. Now, opponents to non-invasive ventilation will say, non-invasive ventilation is not for the asthmatic patient because they have no trouble getting air in, it's just getting trouble with air out. But what those people fail to realize is that the person who comes in with life-threatening asthma is fatiguing. And you need to get their muscles going as long as you can so those medications can kick in before they crash on you. So start non-invasive early on these patients and help them to splint their muscles open and help their work of breathing. Now, you've heard the adage before, never intubate an asthmatic. In fact, Mel Herbert has one of my most favorite quotes of all time, and it goes like this. The indication to intubate an asthmatic is never, unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> now, as a young resuscitationist, I didn't know what to do with that but I believe you have to see many of these patients to understand when to intubate. Don't want to intubate too early, but you certainly don't want to wait for them to be a crash airway. So the best way that I can translate to you, if you haven't seen these patients before, is look for the person who initially is tachypnic, who's starting to slow down, the person who's starting to get somnolent, the person who's starting to retain CO2, and the person whose stats start up in the high 90s starts to dwindle down. These are the indications that the person is starting to crash, and you want to get the airway early. And if you're going to do the airway, preparation is key. And there's a couple things you want to do. Get a liter of fluids hanging up on this person early on. They've been diaphoretic, they're tachypnic, they have so much insensible loss, their tank is going to be empty. When you push your meds, they're going to drop their pressure. So preload them early on. Go with large tubes. Instead of the 7-5 for females and 8-0 for males, go for an 8 for female, 8-5 for male. And the reason why is the larger the tube, the less resistance. But most importantly, when they get up to the ICU, they may be having bronchoscopy to take out the mucus plugs. So do your intensivist a favor and go big. Using induction meds like ketamine are great because we already said that they cause bronchodilation. But the last thing you need for preparation is you need the best person in the department to do the airway. You need your Rich Levitans, your George Kovaches, and if that's you, wonderful. But first pass success is key for these patients because every missed airway is leading to more retention CO2 and more opportunity for acidosis. Post intubation, you want to be sure that you're doing nice, slow, one-handed bagging. You might find that there's resistance in the airway. Avoid the temptation to really squeeze down and squeeze that bag. It's going to lead to barotrauma. It's going to lead to tension pneumothorax, so nice, easy bagging for your patients.
Post intubation, you got to get medications on early. And specifically, you want to make this patient deep. This is not a person who you want to keep light and let them spontaneously breathe. You want to put them down. So high dose analgesia, whether that's fentanyl, remifentanyl, or hydromorphone, whatever you use, give them good analgesic first. And then go for your sedative hypnotic. Propofol is great, causes bronchodilation. Ketamine, even better, also bronchodilation. And in rare cases, you might choose to paralyze the asthmatic. When you have somebody who's having difficulty with the ventilator, a dose of paralytic is going to improve the compliance of their chest. Let's talk a little bit about the ventilator settings. This is one where you can't just throw out some nondescript settings. What you do is very, very important. And starting with a low respiratory rate is critical. The lower the respiratory rate, the more time you have for expiration. And I start off at a rate of 10, but we're not done here. In a second, I'll show you how I continue to titrate that down. I go with a volume mode of ventilation, and I go for seven cc's per kg of ideal body weight. And we might wind up going down a cc at a time per ideal body weight if we're having difficulty with ventilation. We don't want to start off with a standard PEEP of five or seven, whatever we use. Lower PEEP is important because these patients typically don't have trouble with oxygenation, and giving these patients PEEP might decrease your expiratory flow. Setting a peak pressure alarm higher than normal is also critical because these patients have a lot of resistance in their chest, and when the vent goes to deliver a breath, you're going to hit the peak pressure alarm, and when the peak pressure alarm goes off, breaths are not being delivered, and that's critical for your patient. So set the peak pressure alarm high, and be mindful of your plateau pressures, but don't pay too much attention to the peak pressures. And then finally, setting your flow rates higher than normal to 80 liters per minute ensures that you're going to get the inspiration, that breath in, much sooner and provide more time for expiration. So increasing the flow rates for a constant high volume decreases your inspiratory time and by default increases your expiratory time. As I said, you're not going to leave the person's bedside with the respiratory rate. You have to know this flow diagram, and if you see something like this where there's air trapping, keep titrating down your respiratory rate till you get something like this, where the expiratory limb of your flow rate gets back to zero before the next inspiration. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, all these changes are going to lead to hypercarbia, and that can't be good for my patient. And certainly, a respiratory therapist is going to come to you and say, we have respiratory acidosis, we have to make changes. But in the words of the wise Chris Nixon, remember, euboxia is something we want to avoid. If you go for euboxia on this patient, if you go for normal numbers, this patient will die on you. Tolerate permissive hypercapnia in this asthmatic. Despite all this, you might find patients that are still refractory. And in these cases, you want to get on the phone with your anesthesiologist because volatile anesthetics such as sevoflurane might break the severe bronchoconstriction. Now, there are devices that are available where you can put the inhaled gases in standard ventilator circuits in some hospitals, but this is something that you're going to call your anesthesiologist for, for backup. And then, of course, if all that fails, you all have ECMO, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> Don't you love it when you go to a conference and they say, just put them on ECMO? Now listen, if you're in a center with ECMO, by all means, use it. But if you don't, you're going to still be stuck. And you'll see more and more of these devices that are coming to market. They are extracorporeal CO2 devices. And what they do is basically clear the blood out of CO2, and there are reports of patients who don't even need to be intubated with severe asthma or COPD exacerbations. These indwelling catheters and smaller bore than ECMO catheters can clear out the blood of CO2 and allow the patient to still oxygenate and have normal CO2. And finally, when you have a patient who's arresting, and you will find a patient despite your best efforts that arrests on you, what you have to remember is not to start off standard ACLS. You need to do a couple things first. The first thing you want to do is disconnect the person from the ventilator. Push gently down on the chest and reduce that compartment syndrome that has developed from that breath stacking. Look at the endotracheal tube. Ensure that there's no obstruction, whether it's a kink or a mucus plug, and everything is in place. Check for pneumothorax, and if you're unsure, do bilateral finger thoracostomies on the patient to relieve attention pneumothorax. Then and only then should you start CPR on your patient. And most importantly, don't forget to send stat labs specifically looking for hypokalemia because of all the albuterol and epinephrine that they've gotten, you very well could have hypokalemia that led to this arrest. The patient with life-threatening asthma is not a patient we see frequently, but it is something that every resuscitationist should know how to do. 
I hope and Sarah hopes that by sharing this story today, you will learn some pearls that takes you to your next shift and helps you to save these patients. And with that, I thank you so much for your attention.